Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to OutSystems Retail Banking Webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about how to move banking experiences from a product-centric uh, banking model to a customer-centric one. So it's a very important, timely topic for banks, and we're really um, thrilled to welcome our panel of guest speakers today. Uh, today, we have Allison Clark, who's a principal analyst and digital business strategist uh, Sorry, principal analyst, digital business, and uh, digital business strategy at Forrester. We also have Jadeep Duck, um, who's a general manager with a specific focus on retail banking um, for Persistent Systems, one of our key partners here at OutSystems. I'm your host, Michael Douglas. I'm a product marketing manager here at OutSystems. Um, so, just a few typical housekeeping items um, to ensure that we have a really um, a meaningful experience today. So throughout the webcast, you know, feel free to submit any questions that you have um, and through the Q&A module. Um, we'll, we'll have some time available at the end of the presentation where we'll be answering your, your questions live. Um, and uh, for a better sort of visibility of the content, please expand the, the slide area by dragging the corner of the box for, to maximize a full screen. Um, and finally, uh, we'll be pushing out a recording of the, we the webcast, and so it'll be available to all um, with an email link um, later today. Um, with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Allison, um, who will be able to take it from here. Thank you, Allison. Perfect. Thanks, Michael, and welcome, everyone. So let's take a look at how you can move bank experiences from product centric to customer centric, and you know. It's a common problem we see in financial service services firms, not just in banking. Um, you know, not least because of you know regulations and compliance and things like that, and but also because of uh, you know siloed organisations and, and how things are structured. So let's take a look at um, you know a few things that are that are happening from the customer's perspective, and then. Um, some of the things that you can do to start um, developing more customer-centric um, strategies. So at Forrester, we work with business and technology leaders to develop customer-obsessed strategies that drive growth. And as part of that, we collect a lot of data on consumers uh, around the globe. Um, and in fact, I think we collect data on around 80% of the world's GDP consumers. So. We know a lot about consumer behaviour, particularly as it relates to technology and so on. Um, some interesting trends that we're seeing out of this data that we've been seeing for the last few years. So we're seeing a huge increase in the willingness uh, to experiment. So consumers are increasingly willing to try new things, new technologies. We're also, of course, seeing increased device usage. Um, and we're also seeing an increased appetite in what we call the digital and physical integration. So we're seeing, um, you, you know, it, it's no longer kind of good enough for financial services firms to be thinking in terms of the digital channel and the physical or the branch channel because customers don't think that way. Uh, in fact, I often say that the word channel should be written on a piece of paper, scrunched up into a tight ball and thrown into the pits of fiery hell, <laughs> pretty much because um, customers don't think in channels. I mean, think about your own shopping experiences. Do you think in channels? Uh, probably not. So, you know, consumers are expecting these lines to be blurred and, and this digital physical integration. So, for example, you know, if I go into a branch, I've clearly got my phone with me, not that I've left at the door. So they're expecting a digital and physical experience. Um, you know, we're seeing this start to play out with ATMs, being able to use your phone to get money out of ATMs. Um, and similarly, you know, in physical um, uh, other kind of locations and, and things we're seeing this kind of blur between digital and physical. And you may have experienced it yourself, even at, at kind of retailers. We're also seeing a huge um, appetite and an increase of information savviness for consumers. And lastly, the, the kind of last big trend that we're seeing in consumer behaviour is this um, uh, increase in what we're seeing of, of demand and, and kind of self-efficacy. What do I mean by that? Well, the self-efficacy is, you know, what's in it for me? Um, and if we translate that into financial services, that starts to translate to, well, well, what's in it for me? Why should I bank with you? Um, how are you going to help me improve my financial situation? Um, 
you know, how are you going to help me above and beyond just the product that you're trying to sell me? You know, um, particularly if I think that your products are kind of the same as everyone else's. So if we think about some of these trends that are happening, we do find that many financial institutions aren't ready to meet these expectations. And of course, you know, we have a lot of disruptors entering the market, coming in and um, uh, entering different parts of the value chain and, and different lines of business. Uh, but of course, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that most of the disruptors are going to take away significant market share. That's not really the worry. The worry is that they're disintermediating and they're driving a wedge between traditional firms and their customers. And they're doing that by curating better experiences, um, basically for your customers. So by delivering better experiences, they're getting close to the customer and traditional firms are getting further away. In fact, if we think about these disruptors when they come in, they actually have a very different mindset um, in how they think about customers. And, and you know, as we, we think about the theme today of moving from product centric to customer centric, um, you know, many of the disruptors have this nailed and, and, and it's because of the way they think. They do things like they obsess about meeting customer needs. Um, they think about delighting customers with superior digital experiences. They think about capturing and analysing data to offer better products and services. And they also rely on low cost referral marketing. Uh, they're also innovating at speed, using software to automate processes and they're partnering with digital ecosystems, and finally, they're experimenting with new business models. They're doing things differently than traditional firms. Now, many of you on the phone that are, are, are traditional firms may look at this and go, hey, we're doing some of this. And I absolutely agree and, and believe that many of you are doing some of this. But I don't see a lot of traditional firms doing all of these things well. So in order to become customer obsessed, um, you know, we've done a lot of research at Forrester what drives um, great customer experiences, what drives customer-centric um, uh, organisations uh, to become customer obsessed. And through that research, we found a number of key things. The first is that you know, it's important to drive a culture that is customer obsessed. And I'm going to talk about what we see in our research here and some of the, the traits that we see coming through that really makes um, and then kind of shifts and raise the bar, raises the bar with customer obsession. But firstly, if we just talk, I'm talking about culture here for a moment. What is culture? Well, culture is a set of shared values and beliefs that drive behaviour. So at the end of the day, it's kind of what people do. You might say you're something, but it's kind of what people do. Um, and it's what people do when no one is looking. So you can have all the different organizational structures in the world and do all the different things you like in the world. It doesn't matter because culture is what people do when no one is looking. And whether those structures are right or wrong, it's culture that kind of trumps it each and every time. And when we look at firms that are driving these real kind of customer-centric um, uh, experiences and driving revenue at a much, much faster rate than their peers because they're delivering exceptional experiences, we find that they have a number of traits in common. So through our research, we, uh, we came up with, um, you know, we found that these firms are doing as well and have this customer-obsessed DNA. The first thing that they've done is they've moved from being customer aware to being customer led. You might look at that and go, oh, what's the difference? We're, we're, we're customer aware, I think, or maybe we're customer led. Well, the difference is customer aware is about reacting to what you know about your customers. So it's getting all that data and getting all that lovely insight and, and, and information from your customers to figure out how to serve them and what products to design for them. And it's reacting to them. Being customer led though, it's being one step ahead. So it's being where your customers are going to be next. So one way to think about it, there's a, a, a term in Japanese service um, kind of culture called uh, omotenashi. And omotenashi is it's kind of like a game of chess where you're thinking two or three steps ahead. So to give you an example, um, uh, actually, it's an example that happened to me recently when I was traveling in, in Canada. 
I was uh, uh, at a sushi restaurant and the um, uh, I was sitting at the counter and the uh, the, uh, the, the the sushi uh, kind of chef or guru, whatever you call them, the ma- master. Um, uh, put a plate in front of me with a pile of ginger. And he set my plate up just like everybody else's on the counter. And then before he served the first dish, I saw him turn the plate around. And I couldn't figure out why he'd done it until I was a couple of, uh, couple of bites in. And I realized he'd done it because he figured out that I was left-handed and everybody else at the counter was right-handed. So he moved the ginger over and turned the plate around so that the pile of ginger was on the left-hand side. So he was thinking two or three steps ahead to when I was going to go reach for that ginger to make it much easier for me to do that. And we see this a lot. You know, similarly, you know, um, if you're trading uh, with Japanese airlines, uh, one of the Japan, you know, with Japan Airlines, um, they'll, 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 part of the training is if that you serve a customer a drink, if the customer has their laptop open, or computer open, then you should put a lid on that drink when you serve it. Why? Well, gee, what happens if there's turbulence? What happens if that drink spills over the laptop? So it's about thinking two or three steps ahead of your customer and deeply, deeply understanding them with deep empathy so that you know where they're going to be. And so you're designing and building experiences and trying to preempt and be proactive with them. And that's the difference between customer aware and customer led. We see firms uh, starting to think this way, uh, uh, like USAA. USA is a great example of this. They actually have uh, an entire team organised around helping a customer find a home. Now, that's a very different proposition than the mortgage team, right? Many of you probably, if you're in banking, have a team that's focused on mortgages. And it could be mortgage products, it could be mortgage sales. But if you have a team that's, a cross-functional team that's organised around helping a customer find a home, it cha- even that language starts to change your thinking. It starts to open up to kind of say, wow, okay, well, what else is a customer going to need when they, they buy a home? How do we help them find that home? I mean, a mortgage is only one part of it, right? And it starts to create a real deep empathy for the customer and start you thinking about how do you build solutions that are then customer-led, that are really kind of preempting and two or three steps ahead so that you're there when the customer's needed as opposed to just reacting. The second trait that we see um, from these leading customer sex firms is they've moved from being data-rich to insights-driven. And again, you're going, oh, gosh, you know, we're spending a lot of time focusing on data. Um, yeah, but the problem is that even while many financial service firms are yet to get their head around the data and have many, many issues with systems and technology around data. The sad thing is that leaders have already moved on from this. The leaders are now insight driven. So they have not only got their head around their data, but they've got technology and tools and techniques to be able to deliver insights out of that. And they're putting those insights in the hands of their employees across the organization in real time. And they're doing things like the 360 degree view of the customer. And it's interesting, I talk to a lot of banks about 360 degree view of the customer and they think that's simply about all of the products and interactions they have with the firm. That's actually not a 360 degree view of the customer. This is a 360 degree view of the customer. Now this is where you start to understand not just what they're doing with you, but what is their tech ownership? What are their demographics? What are their interactions and transactions and marketing responses? What are their feedbacks and opinions? Who are they interacting with? What about social media and other things? What are their affiliations and and so on? What are their preferences and disposition? And what's their context? Where are they? What's their location? What's their environment? What's their journey? So it's far beyond just the products and the people they're interacting with in your firm. It goes much, much deeper. And leaders are trying to put these insights into the hand of all employees, not just the employees on the front line serving customers, but employees in the organization making decisions every single day. So decisions are then made for this. Product development decisions, communications decisions, strategy, executive decisions, you name it, operational decisions, and we'll talk about operations a little bit later, but decisions are being driven from insights, not, and that's the difference, it's being done in real time. The third thing is that they're moving from perfect to fast, and this is a struggle I realise for many financial services firms, because, but, you know, we've got all these regulations. Well, 
so do many other industries. And in fact, there's many financial services firms that are figuring out how to move from perfect to fast. Perfect to fast doesn't mean non-compliant, okay? Um, it means doing it in a safe environment that, that is compliant, but, a, but doing it at speed. When we're seeing firms like Lloyd's in the UK cut the time from idea to production. So in the past, it used to take them 10 to 18 months to get something from an idea into production. They're now at about four to six months and they're trying to move to one month. I know many firms, even Macquarie Bank in Australia, you know, two week sprint. So, you know, this kind of um, perfect to fast, you know, building, you know, building this massive big kind of mountain that takes a year or 18 months to build and then launch, you know, that's just not, not good enough anymore. Um, it's not fast enough to enable you to keep changing um, and adapting to customers' experiences and to be customer-centric. And the last trait in terms of the culture and the customer set DNA is, is moving from siloed to connected. And we know, you know, financial services firms have struggled for a very long time and continue to struggle with silos. But again, we're seeing some, some movement now um, with some uh, larger firms, like you know, one example of Lloyd's, I'm going to give you another in a moment, but Lloyd's um, moving up, you know, they've set up 10 cross-functional teams and each of those teams is focused around a customer journey. And that's how you move from product-centric to customer-centric. You don't have product teams, you have client teams, customer journey teams, and they work together to focus on, um, you know, serving and, and, and helping that customer with those needs throughout their journey. And so that's the unifying factor here. It's the customer. It's customer-led and it's customer-obsessed. Similar, we see um, Scotiabank, Scotiabank's digital factory, um, Scotiabank in Canada. They have a digital factory that works with cross-functional teams to improve key journeys. In fact, the digital factory began thinking about mortgage onboarding. So that was, that was the journey that they initially started. Um, but the way the factory works is they've got a full-time core team um, of people, which is called the family. They have uh, a, a, then a, a bunch of kind of subject matter experts that get brought in um, for different projects. They're involved full-time and part-time, and they call them friends. And then there's other stakeholders that are brought in on an ad hoc basis as needed, either internally or maybe external partners, and that are coordinators. But the unifying thing is that they're actually working together around a customer to solve a customer problem or to add value to a customer. So that customer and their journey and their needs is at the core of what they do. Um, and even working collaboratively is becoming mainstream. And I apologise, it looks like uh, some of my slide has uh, been chopped off on the left there. Um, so, you know, what we see in our data is that, you know, 72% um, uh, of firms are, um, are using cross-functional teams. Um, per individual project. 64% uh, uh, are using the digital team to guide development and release schedules. 62% um, are using the various development methodologies. Um, and, you know, interestingly, only 52% are um, developing project and workspaces that encourage collaboration. And in fact, having a workspace that encourages collaboration and those cross-functional teams is important. And, you know, certainly, whilst 50% are doing it's great, that means, you know, the other 50, you know, there's a long way to go. So, um, and I apologise again because my slide, I'm not quite sure why this slide has appeared here. Um, okay, the other thing that's happening is that with, um, uh, in terms of, you know, driving these great experiences with customers and so forth, is we see, um, firms embracing design thinking as a common framework. This is another great way to break down those silos and have everybody connected. But what it also does is because design thinking starts with empathising with the customer, it starts to create customer empathy. So bringing in, you know, people from legal and compliance and all across the business right at the beginning to help empathise with the problem that you're trying to solve from the customer's perspective really helps break down those silos because, again, Rather than being aligned around, you know, a common product or whatever, everyone becomes aligned around a common customer goal or, you know, emp and empathising with that customer. So design thinking is a great technique. And we see firms using design thinking, but probably only in pockets. 
firms that do this well, they're doing it across the entire organisation. In fact, IBM has a design thinking um, uh, program where every single employee across the entire organisation is trained in the techniques. Why? So that they can apply this new way of thinking to everything they do. Be it something they're working through on their own, they're working through with other people and other teams. It doesn't have to be this digital technology project either. I've seen some really great results on customer communications and offer documents um, and other um, kind of experiences out of this as well. So, you know, it, many on the phone might be going, yeah, we do design thinking. I challenge you to kind of look at it and go, but are, is it embedded as the way your entire organisation does business? Or is it just those of you sitting in the innovation team or those of you sitting over maybe in the digital team? Because it really does need to be embedded much more broadly. So customer assessed DNA is important um, and having that customer assessed culture. But the second thing that's important to start kind of breaking this down and moving away from being product centric to client centric is knowing the four rules of digital business. So um, being a digital business doesn't just mean, oh, I don't have branches and things. It's not about that. A digital business uses digital technology um, to drive, you know, harnesses those digital technologies to drive and deliver better experiences for customers and more flexible and agile operations. It doesn't mean you, have, you, you don't have a physical presence. So we see traditional firms transforming and becoming more digital and becoming a digital businesses. Of course, we have um, disruptors that are often born digital, um, digital only banks and so on. So, you know, what I'm talking about here though is, is firms that are, um, it, it, what I'm talking about as a digital business is, is the way you operate and the way that you think. And there are four rules to digital business and four areas. Firms that are very mature uh, digitally and in their digital transformation or their digital business are, are focusing on these four areas. They're focusing on the digital experiences, which is about delivering experiences that are easy, effective and emotional. They're focusing on operations and digital operations. So they're reconceiving products and capabilities to deliver better outcomes. They're focusing on digital innovation um, to continuously improve and break through the digital frontier. And they're also focused on the digital ecosystem, the platforms and partnerships to accelerate its scale. So let me talk briefly about each of these. So digital experience is where we find most firms, of course, focus their time and attention. Um, it's the other areas that perhaps are not as strong. The interesting thing, though, is when we think about digital experiences or we just think about experiences generally with banks, we find there's a huge lack of differentiation in the current state. It comes out time and time again in our customer data, um, our customer experience data, when we do um, benchmarks and we research the, the digital experiences or, or other experiences of financial services firms and particularly banks. And you may think that you're different, but the issue is your customers don't think you're different and that's the challenge. I mean, let me throw this out to you. If I come to you as a customer, new customer, um, I'm looking for a new bank, uh, I uh, maybe I've moved cities or whatever, so I need I need something I need to I need your help to help me manage my day to day banking and transactions and bills and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I also have a couple of goals that I'm saving for as well. You know, I want to go skiing and Whistler, and um, you know, maybe I'm saving for a new car or a house. What do I get offered? I probably get offered a checking or a savings account, right, or both. And it's interesting that I get offered that because. Consumers don't think about their money that way. I mean, kind of been forced to think about it that way, but it's not how they want to think about their money. Consumers actually think about their money in buckets, right? I've got this bucket to pay off the mortgage. I've got this bucket for college fees. I've got this bucket, you know, for charity. I've got this, this bucket for this big round the world trip that I want to do. So it's like they're these expenditure buckets and their savings buckets that I'm thinking about. And it's interesting because for so long, and I know that there are rules and regulations about what you call your products, but it's not about that. Because for years and years now, and this example, gosh, I think I, I, I don't know how long this has been going, but I think this is at least five years old. Down in New Zealand, we see two banks doing this. This is an example from BNZ in New Zealand. Um, when you open an account with them or you decide to do your banking, this is what your mobile banking and your online banking looks like. I can actually, and this is not just about naming accounts, so at any time I can just click on that plus button and I can add another bucket. 
I'm not opening a new account. I'm not filling out an application form. So if I've got three savings goals, I don't need three savings accounts. Um, instead, I can just go, oh, I need a bucket of money for fun. I need a bucket of money for, you know, for my whisper trip. I need a bucket of money for, you know, for some house stuff. So you can see they're, they're spending buckets and they're saving buckets. Now, you kind of might go, oh, but we can't do that with regulations and blah, blah, blah. And, and Well, New Zealand has got regulations just like the rest of the world. Interestingly, do you want to know how they've been doing this? When a customer opens an account, they're technically opening 25 accounts in the background. Now, you might think that sounds scandalous and fraudulent. Well, the customer doesn't get charged for it. There's nothing. There's no downside. There's nothing. It's just that when the customer clicks on that plus button, they're activating it, and then they can call it what they like. But the point is it saves them opening an account each and every time. It's, and it's interesting. We see a lot of firms developing personal financial management tools. So I can track my goals. So I can track saving for a car, saving for a house, and maybe my ski trip in Whistler. But then there's a disconnect because I've only got one savings account with my bank. If I want three, I've got to open the other two. So this is, you know, I guess I'm putting this up to challenge how you think about your customers and the way they deal with their money and interact with their money um, because we are seeing the same product-centric ways of delivering experiences to customers um, through a checking and a savings um, as we have for years in, in many, many firms and many, many places. But here's, you know, I'm trying to show you an example here because we do see firms starting to think about this differently and starting to get closer to what's actually going on with the customers and how they think about their money. The other thing is that um, we do find that financial services firms, when it comes to experiences and digital experiences, don't perform well on emotion. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because if you're thinking about experiences, there are three principles of what we call the three E's of customer experience, ease, effectiveness, and emotion. From all this data that we collect here at Forrester um, with customers and how they feel about their firms, we find that financial services firms they do pretty well on ease and effectiveness, generally. Investment firms of, you know, ease is how, how easy it is to do something. Effective is can I actually get it done? Um, what we do find is emotion is much, much lower. So they perform worse than it. And so this is the area for differentiation. This is the area where firms need to do better. And they also need to do better because emotion, and we, we have proven this with our data many, many times, Emotion has a bigger impact on brand loyalty than effectiveness or ease. So there's an actual dollar number behind this. And when we're thinking about emotions, it's not just making customers happy. So we go, okay, well, we'll, we'll focus on the moments of truth and we'll make them happy. Well, it's not just about making them happy. In fact, the emotions that drive customers um, towards you and, and be, to be more loyal to you and want to do more business um, and those emotions that maybe drive them away they can be different for different firms and, 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 and you know, we, we help firms understand that. But, but, you know, if we look broadly at financial services, what we found this year is that um, if a customer feels appreciated, respected, valued and confident, that's what drives them to be more loyal to you. Oddly enough, the financial services firms don't do very well on those attributes. So it's what drives customers, the customers that are loyal to you and want to be loyal, that's what drives loyalty. But in terms of how well firms are doing on those elements, not very well at all. Um, in terms of the negative emotions, so what drives them away, it's being annoyed, disappointed and frustrated. So it's about thinking about this differently. I apologize, we have another slide out of order here. Um, I want to talk about digital operations now, and I'm going to go back to that slide, um, and we'll get the slides updated before we send them out to you. Um, in terms of digital operations, which is the second rule of digital business, it's about reconceiving products and capabilities to deliver better outcomes. Um, what's interesting is what we actually find is traditional firms think very differently than digital firms or customer-obsessed firms when it comes to operations. So traditional firms tend to focus their operations on transactions. They think about efficiency. They think about they've got to implement it for expert users. It's very high, high customized, tailor-made. 
It's usually based on operational analytics and, and historical data, and it integrates with other fixed internal systems. Digital businesses and businesses that are customer obsessed think very, very differently. They think about and focus their operations on interactions, not transactions, interactions. And so they start to think about flexibility and speed. They think about how can we design things so that um, uh, casual and dedicated users can accomplish tasks. Instead of just designing an operational uh, uh, element for employees, how do we design it for customers, employees and partners? Instead of it being customizable and tailor-made, how do we make it modular and scalable? They think about how do we make it a touch screen, a voice control? How do we focus on experience and outcome analysis? And how do we focus on you know, integrating it so that it's, it's instead of you know, fixed internal systems, we need it to be rapidly changing with many systems over time. So they think about their operations differently. And if there's one thing I'll leave you with, is think about are your operations focused on transactions or are you, op are you focused on interactions? Because focusing on interactions is what's going to um, drive you to be more um, customer obsessed um, and customer centric in the way you do business. The third area I want to focus on, so the third rule of business is digital ecosystems. This is about building platforms and partnerships to accelerate and drive scale. And again, we see traditional businesses thinking very differently. So this is about becoming an open business and we find that open businesses reframe their strategy. So a traditional firm tends to think about their business like this. What business are we in? Who are our customers? What channels can we reach our customers through? What partners can help us reach customers through those channels? And how can integration increase value chain efficiency? The firms that are more open, um, certainly looking um, uh, you know, more from a platform situation and, and, and extending their business, they think very differently. Instead, they go, what are we uniquely good at and what are our unique assets? What ecosystems can benefit from our assets and capabilities? What relationships will allow us to enter those ecosystems? Which capabilities do we connect to which relationship? And then how do we continuously optimise connections to win, serve and retain customers? So as you can see, the thinking is very different if you're focusing on ecosystems um, and being an open business. And in fact, these firms also think in processes and adjacencies to create value. So they've moved from product centric to customer centric because they're thinking about their customer's ecosystem. Now many of you on the line here may do um, journey mapping, but I encourage you to think about customer ecosystem mapping. So you know, what are the goals of your customer? What's influencing them? What are their interests, their communities? What are the other firms and other products they're interacting with? Then it's about what comes before your part and what comes after your part? And how can you partner or build or what supplies can you use to deliver um, a, a, and curate an experience that's broader than just the product you're serving to that customer? And the last area is around digital innovation. So this is about continuously breaking through the digital frontier. Um, and you know, in order to do that, it's, you know, of course you need a disciplined approach to innovation. It's about generating ideas from employees and customers and using social collaboration tools. Um, we see many firms innovating, but they're not necessarily crowdsourcing that innovation and doing it with employees and customers. Of course, it's evaluating and, and figuring out which, which, uh, which innovations go forward and incubating and nurturing them, and then moving over into implementation to bringing that to fruition. Um, and we often find that you know, um, firms that are innovating don't always have a very strong disciplined approach. They might do, do great at the kind of, yeah, we're, we're here and we've got a prototype, but then they have problems in uh, delivering and, and, and driving out innovation um, into um, the broader customer base, if you like, and implementing it. And so, you know, firms that do this well and that innovate well, they're using things like design thinking techniques. They're bringing in partners like legal and compliance and others that are going to help them operationalize this at the end. They're bringing them in at the beginning of the funnel, not just at the end. And that's helping them deliver experiences faster. And of course, you need a balanced portfolio, right? So firms that, that do innovation well, they, they have some things that are incremental change and quick wins. But they understand where they're going and they're building things that are, are driving sustained innovation and radical change. It might be technology or solutions that are going to take several years to implement. 
well, that doesn't stop them innovating and focusing on the customer. The point is they know where they're going and they're making sure that they've constantly got a portfolio of innovation that's moving forward. And even the governance um, around that is, is, is such that they're managing this as a portfolio to reduce the risk to the organisation. So to make experiences as product-centric, you need a customer-first operating model. And we spoke about these operational principles and, and, and these traits to being really customer-obsessed. You also need to follow the four rules of digital business, from digital experiences to digital operations to ecosystems and innovation. And with that, I'm going to say thank you and, uh, um, and hand over to uh, Judy. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Alison. Um, so just wanna give a quick recap on Jadeep. Um, so Jadeep um, is a general manager for focused on financial services for Persistent Systems. Persistent is one of our key partners um, within this area. So we're very excited to have uh, Jadeep on the call. And Jadeep is gonna be walking everyone through the platform approach to retail banking um, and some of the real life world experiences that he's been, um, interfacing with um, with using OutSystems platform. So over to Jadeep. Uh, thanks, Michael, and uh, hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, we just saw Alison talking about uh, moving the banking experiences from product-centric to uh, customer-centric. Uh, more specifically, this is about ensuring that we look uh, strictly through the customer's eyes and redefine those customer journeys outside in and not the other way around. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, real-life implementation. I'm going to sort of you know, do a drill down to one of the examples that Alison took, and I'm going to you know, walk you through the uh, implementation of the customer journey experiences and the corresponding transformation journey uh, more from the IT landscape uh, perspective. Uh, let's take an example. Uh, this is the retail banking scenario. All of us know what this is, and uh, we have our own uh, little notions about each of them. Uh, I'm going to specifically talk about the savings and the checking account. Uh, why this? Because uh, these are the predominant ways by which we park our money with uh, the banks. Uh, obviously, there are lending and other services as well, and I'm not going to talk about those uh, for today. Uh, one of the reasons why we park this money with the banks, basically because obviously they are our trusted partners. Uh, we feel safe when we keep the money with them. But more importantly, they provide certain services uh, as a part of you know, us parking the money with them. Uh, but the, the, prop, the problem, if you really see it from the end customer's perspective, is the way uh, this parked money is required to be spent on ground. Banks may not at times reciprocate in the same manner. And here is an example. So let's look at the way I, you know, we would typically spend the money. And I would categorize them into three different buckets. Alison briefly touched upon them earlier. So I'm not going to go through all the details. Uh, but the first bucket I call as the non-discretionary spend. I mean, this is the typical uh, spend category which I have to spend. I don't have much control over it. Uh, the, the amounts may vary month on month, uh, but the, the, the spend types would remain pretty much the same. Uh, next up, we have the discretionary spend. I do have some control on how and where and on whom I'm going to spend this particular money. And, uh, you know, uh, if I'm allowed to sort of categorize my banking experience to spend on this particular bucket, banks may actually know more about me, which is a great deal to personalize the offerings towards me. And uh, last up, uh, Alison talked about goals. So here we have the goal account, which is a bit, bit more long-term, a uh, bit more systematic. I have a, a, a larger commitment with the bank to really buy a car or buy a new home in about six months to two years' time, whatever it is. Uh, most importantly, uh, I may have multiple of these accounts, so the view would look, like some, look something like this. I may actually need multiple instances so for each of these scenarios. Most importantly, I would also want to have a better customer experience, and the better customer experience would mean that I actually feel that I'm in control in terms of how am I going to spend the money. It could still be the savings account or the checking account, which we saw earlier, but now the scenario changes completely. 
because the money for non-discretionary spend could be into the checking account, but for the discretionary spend or for the goal accounts, it could be in savings account, we may actually, which may actually come at differentiated rates. Now let's try to apply uh, the four rules that Alison talked about. Uh, she mentioned these four. Now if I need to revisit my customer journey from the way I just described, I need to look at each and every single step of these four rules. I need to redefine my customer journey. It could be a digital or a digital only uh, customer experience journey for me. I may have to redefine my basic product definition itself. I mean, under, underneath, uh, you know, it could still be a savings account or checking account, but by the time it reaches me as a customer, it will get wrapped as a non-discretionary spend or a discretionary spend or a goal spend the way as I want and as many as I want. Uh, most importantly, uh, these customer experiences must be agile, uh, nimble, and innovative, as we saw earlier. Uh, and these all need to be driven by what Alison talked about, the customer obsession. This means we need an ability to launch these experiences rapidly. We need to reciprocate the customer journeys as fast as we could. And we need to seek feedback and improve the experiences as required and all, do all of this, I just talked about, at a very large scale. Now, unless uh, we are a challenger bank, one would need to build these customer-centric banking experiences along with the existing ones. I mean, there is no escape from that. At times, we may actually have both the old as well as the new experiences coexisting together, and that could be a bit of a nightmare for the IT department. What it warrants is the uh, IT landscape that has a very well-defined and segregated layers from the digital platform perspective. The first target area in this particular case would be the set of core and legacy, uh, uh, legacy, uh, out, uh, legacy systems, I beg your pardon. Uh, we have seen time and again that some of the core systems may not have the required flexibility to support these kind of experiences. At times, these core systems are the slowest components of all, and they may actually add a lot of drag to the overall ecosystem. So to begin with, the core system will need to be segregated to build those fast and nimble customer experiences. This may take some time and a lot of willingness, but once the segregation is in place, that can really propel the way one could define the customer experiences and really implement those outside in. Then comes the data layer. Now, this really forms the foundation of the customer-centric experience. The data comes first, and then comes the structure. And that's an important note, because we may have data both within and outside the bank, and it, it, it may come in completely different shapes, sizes, and, and nature. Aggregation and insights from this data, along with the benchmarking, would then pave the way for the required differentiation that we could pass on to the end customers. Next comes, I, I apologize, there is some skew in the, the slide. Next comes the integration view. Uh, this is our cushioning zone, so to speak, where our customer experiences are, are insulated from the internet complexity. This is where we could actually segregate an underlying checking account to a discretionary spend account that I talked about earlier. It also facilitates the digital ecosystem that Alison, Alison pointed out earlier by integrating with the partner ecosystem within and outside the bank. And most importantly, in a way, this layer is self-sufficient to support the end-to-end -end customer experience, including the specific aspects such as security. And then finally, right at the top, we get the experience view. And by that, I don't, I don't mean uh, these are channels. This is more like the reciprocation of the customer journey that we just saw. Interestingly, these digital experiences are becoming more context-driven. They are becoming very specific to certain tasks and not really limited to end-to-end -end mobile or web applications. These are extremely specific and at times come with very short shelf life, what I would call as a disposable do-it-yourself experiences. Now, one has to start discovering and building these experiences that are best aligned to the customer value they serve. This could be achieved through rapid prototyping, running hackathons with, with, with your internal staff, with your end customers at times, and hosting those experiences over a digital sandbox for a quick feedback with friends and families. In a nutshell, all those layers put together build a digital experience platform. 
It supports one to remain customer obsessed, uh, obsessed about customers and build those experiences outside in. Moreover, the platform provides a great ability to roll out these experiences rapidly in a very scalable manner. I'm going to now talk about uh, the, the, a particular example where this was rolled out using uh, the experience platform or digital platform like out system. Here's a global, uh, one, uh, global uh, tier one bank, and you could relate to some of the uh, products which have been launched by fintechs as well. They already had an excellent suite of traditional products and services across multiple channels. However, the bank wanted to relook at its customer acquisition strategy and started off with a very detailed analysis of unbanked and underbanked customers. Unbanked are the people who do not bank at all or who do not have any banking relationship. And underbanked are the ones who do have some, but not the ones that the bankers would like. The analysis helped the bank to lock down on two segments, one of which was millennial customers and, and Generation Z customers, as they are called. Interestingly, the analysis also revealed that the traditional banking products and services won't work for these guys. And the overall customer journey, the product definition itself, needed a complete relook. The segment is also very peculiar because one, they are very hard to acquire, and two, and sadly enough, they are even harder to retain. Every single stage of customer acquisition, as well as customer service and retention, had to be revisited, and the entire process was relooked you know, outside in. Next up, the entire stack had to be built on the core legacy system that had to remain, and it had to coexist with whatever was there. The bank couldn't simply throw away what it already had, so they had to sort of keep it as is and build the stuff from scratch, leveraging the core systems as is. So in order to achieve this fast-paced experience development, the bank built an elaborate abstraction layer, enabling the APIs on top of the core systems. These were essentially mapped to the customer journeys to a large extent to ensure that the data is available seamlessly at the experience layer. The data layer, which I talked about in the previous slide, was getting established as the experience layer was also getting transformed. But all this was done through a very platform-centric approach to ensure that the customer experiences are, are, are driven and implemented through the digital journeys that we envisioned earlier. Finally, the, all the layers, the, the experience layer, the data layer, and the core systems were stitched together through APIs and microservices. Now, the APIs here are, are the key because they had to support the market-facing, the customer-facing view on one end. And on the other end, they had to support the core system because the core system had very rudimentary support for the APIs that they could expose. So for example, I could, I could have a, a checking account in my core banking solution, uh, which is getting transformed into a discretionary spend. So my customer-facing API would look like get me account balance for discretionary spend account whereas my core banking API would say get my account balance from checking account. Now the mapping of these had to be you know, stitched together in the integration layer and all this has to be orchestrated through a digital platform. All this helped the bank to build a digital factory of experiences once the basic platform was in, was in place. Rolling out newer products, services, and feature in a matter of weeks and months was quite possible. All this led to a very exciting outcome. The bank could roll out a mobile-only digital platform, a digital experiences with brand new products, similar to what I had outlined, outlined, outlined earlier. That helped the bank improve the percentage of their digital customers quite significantly. And most importantly, the entire rollout took weeks and months instead of months and years. Even more importantly, the entire transformation journey resulted into a very scalable and digital banking platform to launch the newer products at will. So to summarize, in order to realize the customer-centric experiences, one needs a digital experience platform, the likes of our systems, that can give you freedom to be really focused on customer obsession rather than you know, getting driven by your constraints of the IT landscape. We need speed to implement these experiences faster. We need agility to seek and incorporate feedback as soon as we can. And most importantly, we need the factory model to replicate these experiences at scale. That's one proven framework to move away from product-centric experiences and realize 
a customer-centric banking experience. Thanks, Michael. Back to you. Okay, thank you, Jadeep. That's uh, that was really great insights, and thanks so much for that uh, that overview of the Tier One Bank. Um, so it looks like we have some great questions coming through. Um, Want to take a, a few minutes out? Um, I know we've we, we've only got five or six more minutes, um, but want to look at a few of the questions that are coming through in the panel here. Um, so one of the the questions that have come up is, um, what are the easiest use cases? for us to start in developing this customer-centric approach. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, Allison, maybe if you want, if you wouldn't mind jumping in, thinking about some of the use cases that the banks that you've worked with in the past have, have, have yeah. taken, you've got a, an answer to that. So, so the short answer is um, what you need to do in order to figure out where to start and where to prioritize I mean, it could start with existing things that you have going on at the moment, um, innovations or things that you solutions that you're looking to develop. And I would encourage you to go back and, and, and go through that design thinking process where you start with deep customer empathy to see what ideas that generates and how that might start um, driving the different results. From a broad perspective, though, um, what we find is that what firms typically do is they look at what are their business goals, what are the key journeys that align to those business goals. So let's just say um, you've decided at your organisation that um, you there is a big focus on deposits. Um, maybe the key customers for deposits um, a, a particular type of customer, a particular persona, um, and it might be about digital savings accounts. So you want to then start to understand the customer journey around that um, to figure out what that looks like. When you start to understand the customer journey, that's going to help you figure out what are the areas that we can improve, how do we prioritise, what might we do with product design. And it, it'll be pretty obvious to you from some of those if you do the, the, the journey map of what it looks like now versus the ideal journey map, it'll become pretty clear what areas um, uh, are going to give you maybe some quick wins and some, some easy use cases. So it's very hard to say. It's, you know, you can apply some of these techniques to things that you currently have underway. Um, you do need to get to a point where what you're starting to do with everything is that you you start thinking about the customer first. I mean, even when you're in a meeting tomorrow, you know, um, maybe you're you're sitting in a meeting with a, a product team about something. Keep thinking about the customer. Try and get everybody to come back to the customer. If you're thinking about operations, you know, and talking about something that's being implemented, it's like, well, why are you doing this? What is this going to do for the customer? How can it help the customer? Um, I often say, think about it in terms of how can something add value to a customer and how can something solve a problem for a customer? If it's not doing either of those, you do need to start thinking about why you're doing it. Great. Thanks for that, Alison. Um, so something, we have another question come through. It's a little bit more specific. It says, um, gentleman says, uh, we don't have uh, an internal user experience person. Uh, how much would this impact our ability to move to a customer-centric bank? So I don't have an internal user, user experience. User experience um, uh, resource. How much would this impact our ability to move to a customer-centric bank? Oh, uh, look. Here's the thing, um, customer experience and delivering great experiences is everyone's responsibility. So it starts with deep empathy for the customer. When you're getting down to designing the actual screen for a digital experience, then you need a good UX designer to help you figure that out. Um, admittedly, you can probably go so far on your own um, or there might be external resources you can use. But um, Customer experience and being customer centric doesn't just rely on you having a, a CX team or a particular UX resource at all. Um, I think everyone can do this. And it's, as I said, it starts with this real understanding of what are we trying to do as a business? Who are the customers that we're serving? What do those customers look like? Um, and maybe running some of those design thinking workshops about particular problems you're trying to solve or areas where you're trying to add value. That's what's going to generate the ideas. Because remember, it starts with customer empathy. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, so let me just kind of see if there's any any other questions. 
um, feel free to keep sending them through. Um, but I think what we're going to do now is um, I really want to thank um, both Allison and Jadeep for you know a really great presentation. I think there's a lot of great insights for that. Um, and we're going to follow up uh, with a lot of the questions um, offline. Um, again, uh, the recording for the webcast will be sent later out today. Um, and in that email, there will also be a link to the 2018 Forrester State of Digital Banking Report. Um, so it's another great resource for the audience to have. Um, if you have any more questions or like to speak to someone live, you can also visit our website. Um, we have a retail banking section there at outsystems.com. Um, but uh, please do stick around. There's a short survey that's coming out on, on the webinar that hopefully help us improve the experience. Um, but thanks again for everybody for attending. And um, we hope you really enjoyed this, this uh, first installment. And uh, have a great day.